Well, hello everyone. I'm Iago, Iago Las at X or Twitter. Uh, I'm a front-end developer for more than 10 years now. And since last year, I'm also the co-founder of TimeTime.team. I will do more spam later on if you want. But let's start. <clears throat> First, a uh, typical exercise. Um, please stand up if you are a programmer and you ever had to deal with dates or with time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now raise your hand if that experience was a pain in the ass. Okay, okay, pretty much 70% of the people, thank you very much. <clears throat> you can sit down now. <laughs> so, well, <clears throat> um, the goal of this talk is to give you a brief introduction about the new temporal API. So, as you know, the TC39, which is the group of experts which make TypeScript, uh, JavaScript, sorry, and is working on this new spec called Temporal. So, the, my goal here is to introduce you to these um, principles and why this API is nice. But instead of talking about code, my idea is to give you a brief history introduction. So, and at the end, if uh, I have some left, uh, I will give you some hints about the, how to deal with it and everything. But yeah, that's the idea. So basically, the principles of this new API is that date values can be represented in local calendar systems and they should be convertible to proleptic Gregorian calendar. What? Uh, time, time values are based on a standard 24 hour clock and leap seconds are not represented. How many of you understand this now? Okay, perfect. So let's start from the beginning. Calendar. The calendar is just a tool we humans use to measure and organize time. Like every other tool in the world, it has evolved according to the requirements. So at the beginning, the requirements were very, very soft. Just, yeah. <clears throat> so um, uh, the first calendars, um, in order to measure the um, time, you just need to find any kind of periodic event and count it. So, as you probably know, the sun rises every day and the moon has a cycle of around 29 days. So the first calendar, we're basically counting uh, how many times the sun rises and how many times the moon has a cycle. So you can imagine the first human being saying, hey, my house is in that direction, three suns, uh, and stuff like that. So this worked pretty well at the beginning, but this system has a problem. <clears throat> the problem is that both the sun and the moon is, are not a multiple of the solar year. This means you cannot predict seasons using just the moon or using just days. You need something else, right? Uh, again, this was not a problem for most of the civilizations, but for the Egyptians, they were totally dependent on predicting the flow of the Nile River and sorry about my English, I don't know how to tell it very well, but you know what I mean, the flow and the, all the, the other thing of the river, they needed to predict it very well. That's why they invented the first calendar, well, not the first calendar, but one of the first calendars with um, seasons, which was able to predict seasons. This calendar has uh, 12 months of 30 days and five extra days. This calendar was so good that uh, when Julius Caesar conquered Egypt, he was amazed and he recruited a group of experts to create its own calendar based on the Egyptian calendar. <clears throat> this calendar is known as the Julian calendar and basically goes like this. It's um, 12 months of 31 and 30 days alternative and a last day of 29 days. <clears throat> so this calendar works pretty, pretty well. Actually, it has an error of 18 minutes per year, which is pretty nice if you think about that. So this calendar worked so well that they decided to rename one month in, in, in honor to Julius Caesar. And I don't have much time to tell you all the histories and all the fun facts, but if you see this first version of the calendar, you see that the year starts in March and ends in February. Uh, because of political reasons, the Romans had to change and this calendar and because the elections were on March 
and well, anyway, there were different things involved. But if you think about that, September, October, November, and December were origi originally the most, the, the months seven, eight, nine, and ten. But then they changed that because of political reasons. You can Google that, and it's funny. But even with that, uh, the, this calendar worked pretty well. So they renamed the first month without name to July in, uh, in honor to Julius Caesar. And then uh, his successor, August, wanted to do the same. He renamed Sextilis to August in, in his own honor. And this is a very immense thing. Since uh, his day was 30 days, he didn't want to be less than Julius. And he changed it. <laughs> And he put 31 days in August, and he removed one month from uh, February. So that's basically why uh, those two months had 21, 31 days. So, <laughs> so uh, 1582. Again, this calendar uh, was pretty nice and, and worked pretty well. But by this time, uh, um, the Christians had an error of 10 days. Accum uh, they had accumulated an error of 10 days. That's why uh, the Pope Gregorio, whatever, decided to um, uh, ref um, change the Julian calendar and made small um, changes in order to you know, um, fix the calendar. Basically, the thing is that the solar year has this length. The Julian calendar is um, 36, five days and a quarter. One leap year every four days. So the Gregorian calendar basically changed the rules to adjust this difference. Um, well, I, I'm going to share the slides. Uh, there are mm, different YouTube links and stuff with more about everything because every topic is amazing. The thing is that with the Gregorian calendar, we only had an error of a few seconds per year. So everything is perfect. Now the tool, the calendar, fulfills our requirements. But we still have a problem, the time. So, 1830, suddenly the train appears. So let's go back to high school. Remember this problem that a train departs from Barcelona at a certain speed and a train departs from Galicia at a certain speed when they will cross. This is not only a high school problem, this was a real problem if you think about that. Um, you need to predict where the trains are, are going to cross. And another fun fact, this is a, a train control diagram. On this axis, you have the um, hours, and on the y-axis, you have the stations. So you draw where the trains are at a certain time, and as a controller, you need to ensure that they only cross on places where you have two railways, okay? So basically, you can see that at 1 a.m., the train is in Guarcini, uh, at around uh, 3 a.m., reaches Marinton, stays in Marinton for one hour at, until 4 a.m. and then the part till fail or whatever it's called. At the, um, and at midnight, a train departs from Shannon and goes in the opposite direction, stays in Palmerston for half an hour, still going in opposite direction and comes to Marinton around 3 a.m. They cross for one hour and then they, uh, this train goes in the opposite direction in, in bound to um, Arachimo or whatever it's called. This is one line with multiple trains. You can imagine the complexity of this. And back in those days, there were not GPS, there were not phone calls, not anything. So they needed to rely very well on these error margins. And now <laughs> is the plot twist. Back in those days, every town has his own time. This means that Barcelona, when there was 12 a.m. in Barcelona, in Madrid were and 11.30, and in Galicia were 9.30, because the sun um, was the, um, you know, the time was totally sun-based and local. And of course, <laughs> there were a lot of train crashes back in those days. That's why, for the first time, the UK railway company decided to standardize time across all the stations, because otherwise it was impossible to control the trains. So this company decided to use Greenwich, as the official time for all the stations, period. And it took 40 years <laughs> to use a single standard time in the UK. And actually, if you go to the London, um, Bristol Stock Exchange, you can still see a clock with two handles, one for the local time in Bristol and another one for the um, time in Greenwich, which was time minus the 10 minutes difference, but they didn't want to have the standard time. 
<coughs> so yeah, that's why trains affected in time standardization. Then uh, you know the the standard um, advanced um, the reference meridian was um, established as the wind width. <coughs> the time zones were established, and um, everything was nice again until the fifties. So the thing is. Um, until the 50s, the definition of a second was kind of a mathematical, um, mathematical concept because a second was defined by a definition of a minute and a minute was, was defined as a definition of an hour and an hour was defined as a definition of a day. But what is really a day? A day changes. You don't think about this, but do you really know how many seconds yesterday, uh, how many seconds long was yesterday compared to today? As a human, you, you don't care about that. But maybe trains or GPS, you care. You need more precision. So for the first time, these clocks, um, the atomic clock appear. And these clocks um, measure seconds using uh, chemicals. Uh, I can give you more information about this. But let's say they don't rely on the stars or on the sun. They use a chemical reaction, well, not a chemical reaction, but a chemical property of some atom. So for the first time, you have a perfect uh, way of measuring time. And this is called the International Atomic Time. Basically, you have a, a bunch of um, centers where, where, and they vote and they agree on what time is it. So, in the 60s, we have the International Atomic Time, which is very precise, very, very exact. And you have the Universal Time based on the moon and the sun and the sky and the rotation of the Earth which is the time we as humans use on our daily basis. We don't count microseconds, right? So we needed a way to unify those concepts. And this is when universal time coordinated appeared. This is universal. Eh? <laughs> well, anyway. <clears throat> so basically, uh, UTC is the result of um, fixing the atomic time not fixing, the adjusting the atomic time to the human concept. And this adjustment is called leap seconds. Basically, you add or you remove leap seconds to the tie, depending on if the Earth uh, slows down or, or, you know, or, or slows up. Uh, this year, the difference is 37 seconds. Okay? So first important definition here, leap second. The leap second is the adjustment applied to UTC to accommodate the difference between tie, uh, tie and the observed solar time. Of course, there are many, many systems you can use to measure time. UTC is one of them. Atomic time is on another one, but you can use GPS time. You can use the solar time one. The official time is um, a combination of UTC applying time zones. You have many time. Uh, well, I will give you the link later on if you want, but uh, if you're curious about how many time scans there are, you can scan this and, and, and check it because it's amazing. But as a programmers, we only care about this time. We don't use UTC. We use POSIX time. Then we translate this POSIX time to UTC, but that's another story. And this is the time JavaScript uses, by the way, in this spec. So how POSIX time is defined? The number of non-leap seconds which have passed since the midnight uh, of 1 January 1970, UTC. So non-leap seconds. This is very important, and this is, has many, many implications. We can give you an, another talk about, only about this. But I'm going to give you a, uh, only a quick example of the implications of this. This is very hard. I, I hope to do it well. So what happens when a leap second is introduced? Remember, POSIX doesn't have leap seconds. You need to ignore them by definition. So you have two options. The first option is to step the leap second. Just skip it. The second option is basically slow down the clock in order to get a continuous um, different numbers for every second. So um, how to read this table? In here, you have the UTC time. Here, you can see the atomic time. The atomic time, each second uh, follows this, the next one. It's totally continuous, doesn't care about anything. But in UTC here, you see this 60 second, which is the leap second. Okay? So in POSIX, uh, if you are stepping the leap seconds, you will see that when this leap second is introduced, you have two 
timestamps corresponding to the same second. So you have a problem, especially if you are, you know, playing with money. You can see some situations when a transaction is approved in the 99.50 and then is uh, requested in the 99.0, which is basically going back in time, makes no sense. So most, most of the systems do this smearing, which basically is slowing down the clock to basically uh, have different um, guarantee, different um, timestamps for every second. So you can see the example here that instead of staying in the 98 seconds, we are in the 97 and a little, then we jump to this, then we jump to this, and then we jump to the right one. But during this period, this window, the clock was slowed down. So the implication of this is that not all the seconds last the same. Seconds have different duration. <laughs> so again, depending on your application, um, front-end developers, we don't need second precision because we have uh, time thumbs and everything is uh, screwed up. But if you are on a very, if you require precision like GPS, you probably need a different uh, time system. So I don't know uh, the time right now, but, <laughs> 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 but um, part two is just about um, things to know as a front-end developer. So um, now you have all the theoretical background, let's jump to the um, boring stuff. So, you need to distinguish between a date and an instant. And this is very important. A, a, a date is a human concept. My, my birth date is one day. An instant is a millisecond in reference um, uh, the number of milliseconds which have passed in reference to another millisecond. This is very important because uh, dates in JavaScript are not dates, are instants. So this is very important, again, because uh, many people uh, for example, to represent a birthday. Oh, okay, it's a day like this. This internally is transformed to a timestamp. So take care with this. And for example, in, in uh, the constructor, for example, have some gotchas like, uh, let's see, we build this date, we see the timestamp, and then we print the ISO uh, date. Right? You see, this doesn't match this at all. Do you know why? Local time. What's happening? Time. Exactly. By default, dates are created in local time. This means the language, it's um, interpreting this as a, yeah, as a local time, it's transformed into local time, and then if you try to get the, the, the ISO string, which is UTC, well, it's AGMT, uh, you get a different day and a different hour and, and even a different month and the month is because for some reason the month starts in zero but years and, and days no so be aware with this so <clears throat> um, with dates we just store milliseconds very important and then depending on the time zone you are seeing these milliseconds you will get something different and this this is sometimes right but sometimes it's totally wrong and I came with these two examples, but then uh, Odin, my friend, just told me a better example for this. So let me, well, I, I will keep to this one and then I, I will uh, give you the, the better example. But very important things. Dates should preserve the intention. So for example, if you are on a rocket launch, maybe you want instance. You don't care about if political, um, the politicians change the meaning of the hours or they skip the daylight saving time. You need to rely on this happens, 30 seconds later this happens, 30 seconds later this happens, right? So in this context, you care about instance, you probably need timestamps. But when a medical appointment happens, you are talking about civil dates. So let's say you want to save a medical appointment for the next year. So you basically create the date and you store it as a timestamp. If for, during that time, the rules change, Let's say, for example, Europe removes the daily saving um, change. If you then recover the original timestamp, the date is going to change. It's going to be one hour before, for example. But what do you want? A date at 9 a.m. or a date at 8 a.m.? Do you follow me? Or yeah, yeah. I know this example is 
pretty much a crappy example, but I, I have a better example. So the thing is, let's say you have to take a plane and, you, and it's very early. The plane is at uh, 4 a.m., for example. So you need to wake up around two and a half. So your, your alarm clock is uh, set to two and a half. But that day is the daylight saving change. So at two, they will be th uh, three. So the two and a half doesn't exist. What happens with that clock, with that alarm? Should it ring or should not? It's a nice question. So here you can see the difference between an instant or a, or, or a civil date. If you see this problem as an instant, is the problem here would be that you want to stay in the airport a certain hour, so that's the time reference, and you remove hour from there, and here is the time where the alarm should ring. But if you see this problem as a civil date, maybe you want the, the alarm to ring at, at one and a half. So yeah, those are the two examples. So basically, milliseconds. Don't store milliseconds, don't use milliseconds. UTC, it's basically the same. <laughs> time, uh, daytime and offset. Mm, uh, well, it can work, but you you still lose the original intention because you don't know where this data was created. So you cannot, you're losing information. Local time and time zone. What do you think about this example? Do you see a problem here? This example is ambiguous because during the daylight saving time, you have two, two in the morning. <laughs> so you need to know if this uh, the first two in the morning plus one or the second two in the morning plus two. <laughs> you follow? Yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. During, during the day, daylight saving time, a las tres son las dos. Entonces, las, English or Spanish? <laughs> During the daylight, daylight saving time in, in Spain, we, we have this uh, thing when you, in, in summer, you ah, yeah. slow down the clock yeah. one hour. Okay. So basically, you have one day with two hours repeated. So if you only store this, this day, you have an ambiguity because you have two hours with the same hour and the same time zone, but different offset. So <laughs> you need to save the daytime, the offset, and the time zone. And this is the format that the, the temporal API uses for, the, for creating dates. So basically, in what this API offers, instead of dates, you have instants, which are fixed times since the epoch, milliseconds. If you add a time zone to this instant, you get a sound date time, which is this, basically uh, everything you need. And if you remove the time zone and the instant, you can get local dates. When I say I was born in 1992, I'm referring, well, that's a crap example, but uh, I'm referring uh, to Spain. But um, uh, when I talk about uh, a date, usually I refer to a date in Spain, but maybe in Australia, it was next day, right? So in order to manage uh, these um, wall clock times, you have these kind of objects. And yeah, I, we can talk deeper about that. But um, I don't know how much time I got left. I'm, and that's pretty much all. <laughs> I went very fast. <laughs> what, what does your company do? Uh, ooh, for later, but then. Um, Basically, we offer a set of APIs and database and everything to manage this. So you can create things, uh, create an event in a calendar, and you forget about dealing with time frames and everything. And over this, we build a product, which is like a Calendly, but it's just to showcase what we can do. But it's a crappy company for now. We are still growing. <laughs> but you have to do a lot of time. See. Thanks for sharing. Questions for? Uh, so, like, you, you talked about how to store the data to be precise in the future. <coughs> for instance, if like uh, somebody changed the time zone. Excellent. But what if like it was a sun time zone, for instance, like 
but you know, for the whole Spain. But in some reasons, in Spain, they split the country into two tensions. <laughs> How you will know what is exactly <laughs> that shot was? In the beginning, there was a guy called um, Alex Olson. No, Alex Olson is a skater. Uh, <laughs> I forgot the name, but his guy is my, originally was maintaining the Olson database, which basically is a, f a bunch of TXT files mm, with this kind of random things like, hey, mm, for example, here in Spain, uh, Franco the dictator changes the time zone to accommodate it to the Hitler time zone. So this is reflected in the, in the database saying, hey, during this year, until this year, the Spain changes the time zone. Or, for example, last year, Mexico changed the time zone of one area, just one area, and we had a bug because of that, because the Java version was uh, one version updated, and that change was not reflected. But um, the only solution is having uh, a, a, a collaborative, collaborative database mm -hmm. uh, with mm, these changes as updated as possible. And GPS coordinate for the each. Uh, Sorry. And GPS coordinate of each event. Like you need to know where. I think I think it's based on political, um, not GPS itself, but political regions. Mm -hmm. but, but good point. I mean, yeah, you need, uh, you have these um, translators which translate GPS coordinate to a geopolitical area, and from the geopolitical area you can extract the time zone, the official time zone. But the database itself, I don't think it has uh, GPS coordinates. More questions? Uh, can you tell any funny story about some problems? Sí. About, some <laughs> <laughs> uh, about some problems with the past. What do you mean? Like the past time. So, for example, uh, many times people change something. So, uh, probably some problems that you experience measuring some time, I don't know, uh, 200 years ago at some. The thing is, with the time in the past, especially when you are um, reading historical documents, you don't really know what, which calendar they were using. Actually, <laughs> fun fact about in, in the Olympic Games of the 90, early 90s, uh, ninth century, uh, sorry. I think the Russian team got late because they were using the Gregorian, ca the Julian calendar instead of the Gregorian calendar. So they be they were late uh, thirty days on the Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> I can search for the. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you provide some plugins or models for some databases. Uh, now Postgres has some extensions, which uh, I think fix that problem. I'm a front-end, so I don't know anything about that. Though it's <laughs> okay. uh, I want to ask, is it the fast <coughs> or filtering, manipulating, uh, adjusting or something? Odin, can you help me here? Uh -huh. This guy is back in. I could. Uh, hello, I'm the co-founder of this company, so <laughs> I'm the one that deals with this on the database side. So can you repeat the question, please? Uh, what about the speed? I mean, if we filter this uh, date, uh, for example, adjust and add more days or something, is it speed? Uh, is it related to the speed of the diffusion of the So in the end, what we need to do is to normalize kind of the data that we store, because the, the computation that we need to do, to do uh, let's say, finding events in within some range or something like that, for that, you can't get the local date in memory and then compute with the time zone to get the final date. No, you just need to compute with some instant. What happens is that, as I was saying, is that if, in the middle, if after you store that instant with the time zone, some there is some political change, like removing the DST as this happened in Mexico last year, then you need to recompute what you have stored because that's not valid anymore. So you need to rely on that to do some filtering. You need to just, uh, you know, do some massive update on your database to, to adjust with, with the current instance. Okay. So then after that, uh, the moment you have instance there, it's like a post I mean, this progress is really fast with that query, with those queries, so we don't have problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.